Ez gondszág rá ide, mit műzeksz az erre? Today I'm going to try reading this book. Ah, the lighting's horrible, you know? Ah, uh, this is Adventures in Wonderland. I have no idea how far along I'll get. It is a pretty thick book. Anyone who's read it before knows that. Although I'll only be reading half of it if I even do get through most of it. So let's see what this is like. Opening cover. <clears throat> Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Complete in one volume with four il 54 illustrations by John. Yeah, no idea how to pronounce that. Hopefully I got that right. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Twelve chapters. Starts off with down the rabbit hole, ends up in Alice's evidence. Is that just okay? <clears throat> Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Chapter one. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank, and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. There was nothing so very remarkable in that, nor did Alice think it so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. When she thought it over afterward, it occurred to her that she ought to have... <clears throat> wondered at this, but at the time it seemed quite natural. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it, then hurried on, Alice star started to her feet, for it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it. And burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it, and was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was going to get out again. <clears throat> the rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way, and then dipped suddenly down, so suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep, or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her, and to wonder what was going to happen next. First she tried to look down and make out what she was coming to, but it was too dark to see anything. And then she looked at the sides of the well and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung upon pegs, and turned down a jar from one of the shelves. She took down a jar from one of the shelves as she passed. It was labeled orange marmalade. But, to her great disappointment, it was empty. She did not like to drop the jar for fear of killing somebody underneath, so managed to put it back onto one of the cupboards as she fell past, <clears throat> fell past it. Well, thought Alice to herself, after such a fall as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling downstairs. How brave they'll all think of me at home. Why, I wouldn't say anything about it even if I fell off the top of the house. Which was very likely true. Down, down, down. Would the fall never come? Oh, a yeah. picture of the rabbit. Before we go on. Would the fall... <coughs> Never come to an end. 
I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time, she said aloud. I must be getting somewhere near the center of the earth. Let me see. That would be 4,000 miles down, I think. For you see, Alice had learned several things of this sort in her lessons in the schoolroom. And though this was not a very good opportunity for her showing off her knowledge, as there was no one to listen to her, still it was good practice to say it over. Oh my. <coughs> This is going to be interesting to try and read an entire section. <clears throat> Let's see, now where was I? Mm -hmm. Aha, yes, that's about the right distance. But then I wonder what latitude or longitude I've got to. Alice had not the slightest idea what latitude was or longitude either, but she thought they were nice grand words to say. Presently she began again. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it will seem to come out among the people that walk with their heads downward. The antipathies, I think. She was rather glad there was no one listening this time, for that did, for it didn't sound at all the right word. Well, thank God, I don't think it was meant to be actually pronounced. But I shall have to ask them, what the name of the country is, you know? Please, ma'am, is this New Zealand or Australia? And she tried to curtsy as though... Um, she tried to curtsy as she spoke, fancy curtsying as you're falling through the air. Do you think she could... Do you think you could manage it? And what an ignorant little girl she'll think me for asking. No, it'll never do to ask. Perhaps I shall see it written up somewhere. Down, 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 there was nothing else to do, so Ella soon began talking again. Diana will miss me very much tonight, I should think. Diana was the cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Diana, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. There are no mice in the air, I'm afraid, but you might catch a bat, and that's very much like mouse. Oh, that's very like a mouse, you know. But do cats eat bats, I wonder? And here Alice began to get rather sleepy and went on saying to herself in a dreamy sort of way, Do cats eat bats? Do cats eat bats? And sometimes do bats eat cats? For you see, as she couldn't answer either question, it didn't much matter which way she put it. <coughs> Dang. <coughs> <coughs> She felt that she was dozing off, and had just begun to dream that she was walking hand in hand with Diana, and was saying to her very earnestly, Now, Diana, tell me the truth. Did you ever eat a bat? When suddenly, thump, thump, down she came upon a heap of sticks and dry leaves, and the fall was over. Alice was not a bit hurt, and she jumped onto her feet for in a moment. She looked up, but it was dark overhead. Before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down it. Well, the passage. Uh, this is written in very archaically. Of course, it's a very old book, so you've got that going for it. All right. There was not a moment to be lost. Away went Alice like the wind, and was just in time to hear it say, as it turned a corner, Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting. She was close behind it when she turned the corner, but the rabbit... <clears throat> ...was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hall, which was lit up by a row of lamps hanging from the roof. There were doors all round the hall, but there were they were all locked. When Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door... She walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Suddenly she came upon a little three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it but a tiny golden key, and Alice's first thought was, this might belong to one of the doors of the hall. But alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate it would not open any of, any of them. <clears throat> However, on the second time round, she came upon a low curtain she had not noticed before. 
and behind it was a little door about 15 inches high. <clears throat> she tried the little golden key on the lock, and to her great delight, it fitted. Alice opened the door and found that it was led to a, that it led into a small passage, not much larger than a rat hole. She knelt down and looked along the passage into the loveliest garden you ever saw. How she longed to get out of that dark hall and wander around among the beds of bright flowers and those cool fountains. But she could not even get her head through the doorway. And even if my head would go through, thought poor Alice, it would be of very little use without my shoulders. Oh, how I wish I could open, um, how I wish I could shut up like a telescope. I think I could if I only knew how to begin. For you see, so many out-of-the-way things had happened lately that Alice had begun to think that very few things indeed were really impossible. There seemed to be no use in waiting by the little door, so she went back to the table, half hoping she might find another key on it, or at any rate a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. This time she found a little bottle on it, which certainly was not here before, said Alice, and tied round the neck of the bottle was a paper label with the words Drink Me beautifully printed on it in large letters. Ah. <sighs> It was all very well to say, drink me, but the wise little Alice was not going to do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first, she said, and see whether it's marked poison or not, for she had read several nice little stories about children who had got burnt and eaten up by wild beasts and other unpleasant things, all because they would not remember the simple rules their friends had taught them, such as that a red-hot poker will burn you if you hold it too long, and that if you cut your finger very deeply with a knife, it usually bleeds. <clears throat> and she had never forgotten that if you drink too much from a bottle marked poison, it was almost certainly to disagree with you sooner or later. However, this bottle was not marked poison. Um, so Alice ventured to taste it, and finding it very nice, it had in fact a sort of mixed flavor, of a cherry tart custard pineapple roast turf. Jesus Christ has a lot of flavors. <clears throat> it had, in fact, a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee, and hot buttered toast. She very soon finished it off. What a curious feeling, said Alice. I must be shutting up like a telescope. And so it was indeed. She was now only ten inches high, and her face brightened up in the thought that she was now in the right size for going through the little door into that lovely garden. First, however, she wondered a few minutes to see if she was going to shrink any further. She felt a little nervous about this, for it might end, you know, said Alice to herself, in going out to get altogether like a candle. I wonder what I should be like then. And she tried to fancy what the flame of a candle would look like after the candle is blown out, for she could not remember ever having seen such a thing. After a while, finding that nothing happened, she decided on going into the garden at once. But alas for poor Alice. When she got to the door, she found she had forgotten the little golden key, and when she went back to the table for it, she found she could not possibly reach it. She could not quite plainly... <clears throat> she could see quite plainly through the glass, and she tried her best to climb up on the legs of the table, but it was too slippery, and when she had tried herself out with trying, the poor little thing sat down and cried. Come, there's no use in crying like that, said Alice to herself rather sharply. I advise you to leave off this minute. She generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it, and sometimes she scolded herself so severely as to bring tears to her eyes, and once she remembered trying to box her own ears for having cheated herself in a game of croquet she was playing against herself, for this curious child was very fond of pretending to be two people. Two people. But it's no use now, thought poor Alice, to pretend to be two people. Why, there's hardly enough of meat left to make one respectable person. Soon her eye fell 
on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found in it a very small cake, on which the words eat me were beautifully marked in currants. Well, I'll eat it, said Alice, and if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key. And if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So either way, I'm getting into that garden, and I don't care which happens. She ate a little bit and said anxiously to herself, which way, which way, holding her hand on top of her head to feel which way it was growing. And she was quite surprised to find that she remained the same size. To be sure, this is what... generally happens when one eats cake, but Alice had got so much in the way of expecting nothing but out-of-the-way things to happen that she seemed quite dull and stupid for life to go on in the common way. No, it seemed, not she. My bad. So she set to work and very soon finished off the cake. Okay. <clears throat> that was chapter one. I need a small break. Because reading that much in a row <clears throat> has got my throat hurt. Uh, it's a good book. <clears throat> but the more I speak and read, the more it feels like there's a frog in my throat. Which, according to this book, means it's going to jump out my throat. But I do not think that's going to happen here. Okay. So. Uh, let me tell these people that I'm actually going, and then we'll go on to chapter two. Okay. Excuse me. That is not a proper way to do this. <clears throat> chapter two, The Pool of Tears. Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so surprised that for a moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Hi, D-Man. Hmm. Goodbye, feet. For when she looked down at her feet, they seemed to be almost out of sight. They were getting so far off. Oh my, poor little feet, I wonder who will put you... Put on. I wonder who will put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure I shan't be able. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. You must manage the best way you can, but I must be kind to them, thought Alice. Or perhaps they won't walk. <clears throat> or perhaps they won't walk the way I want to go. Let me see, I'll give them a new pair of boots every Christmas. And she went on planning to herself how she would manage it. It must go by the carrier, she thought. And how funny it'll seem sending presents to one's own feet. And how odd the directions will look. Alice's right feet. Heart. Hearth rug near the fender. With Alice's love. Oh dear, what nonsense I'm talking. Just as this moment her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was now rather more than nine feet high. And she was... And she at once took up the little golden key and hurried off to the garden door. Poor Alice. It was as much as she could do lying down on one side to look through the, in the garden with one eye. But to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry again. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, she said Alice, a great girl like you. She might well say this, to go on crying in this way. Stop this moment, I tell you. 
but she went on all the same, shedding gallons of tears until there was a large pool all around her, about four inches deep and reaching half down the hall. After a time, she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance, and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming. It was a white rabbit returning, splendidly dressed, with a pair of white kid gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in the great hurry, muttering to himself as he came, Oh, the Duchess, the Duchess, oh, I, oh won't she be savage if I kept her waiting? Alice felt so desperate that she was ready to ask help of anyone. So when the rabbit came near her, she began in a low-timed voice, a uh, timid voice, If you please, sir, the rabbit started violently, dropping the white kid gloves and the fan, and scurried away into the darkness as hard as he could go. Alice took up the fan and gloves, and as the hall was very hot, she kept fanning herself all the time. She went on talking, Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things went just on as usual. I wonder if I've been changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think I could remember the feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, then the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, oh, that's the great puzzle. And she began thinking all over all the children she knew that. And here's a picture of her with her neck stretched out <clears throat> and she began thinking over all the children that she knew that <clears throat> were of the same age as herself to see if she could have changed for any of them i'm sure i'm not ada she said for her hair goes in such long ringlets and mine does go in ringlet doesn't go in ringlets at all hello alice i'm reading alice alice um, I'm going to say that name a lot. <clears throat> Besides, she, she, and I'm I. And oh dear, how puzzling it, how puzzling it all is. If I'm, I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see. Four times five is twelve, and four times six is thirteen, and four times seven is oh dear, I shall never get to twenty at this rate. However. The multiplication table doesn't don't signify. Let's try geography. London is the capital of Paris, and Paris is the capital of Rome. And Rome? No, that's all wrong, I'm certain. I must have changed. I must have been changed for Mabel. I'll try and say how doth the little. And she crossed her hands on her lap, as if she were saying lessons, and began to repeat it. But her voice sounded hoarse and strange, and the words did not come the same as they used to. <laughs> How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail, and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spreads his claws, and welcomes little fishes in with gently smiling claws, a jaws. I'm sure those are not the right words, said the poor Alice and her eyes filled with tears again as she went on. I must be Mabel after all, and she'll have to go and live in that pokey little house and have next to no toys to play with and no ever so many lessons to learn. No, I've made up my mind about it. If I'm Mabel, I'll stay down here. It'll be no use their putting their heads down and saying, Come up again, dear. I shall only look up and say, Who am I then? Tell me that first and then... If I like being that person, I'll come up. If not, I'll stay down here till I'm somebody else. But, oh dear, cried Alice, with a sudden burst of tears, I do wish they would put their heads down. I am so very tired of being all alone here. As she said this, she looked down at her hands and was surprised to see that they had put, that she had put on one of the rabbit's little white kid gloves while she was talking. How can I have done this, she thought. I must be growing small again. She got up and went to the table to measure herself by it, and found that, as nearly as she could guess, she was now about two feet high, and was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that the cause of this was the fan she was holding, 
and she dropped it hastily, just in time to save herself from the shrinking away altogether. There, that was a narrow escape, said Alice, a good deal frightened at the sudden change, but very glad. Hard to turn pages for me. But very glad to find herself still in existence. And now for the garden. And she ran with all speed back to the little door, but alas, the little door was shut again. And the little golden key was lying on the glass table just as before. And things were are worse than ever, thought the poor child, for I never was so small as this before, never. And I declare it too bad that it is. And she said these words, as she said these words, her foot slipped, and in another moment, splash. She came up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that she had somehow fallen into the sea, and in that case I could go back by railway, she said to herself. Alice had been to the seaside once in her life, and she had come on the general conclusion that wherever you go on the English coast, you'll find a number of bathing machines in the sea, some children digging in the sand with wooden spades, then a row of lodging houses, and behind them a railway station. However, she soon made out that she was in a pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. I wish I hadn't cried so much, said Alice, as she swam about trying to find her way out. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be a queer thing to be sure. However, everything is queer today. She just heard something splashing in the pool a little way off, and she swam near to make out what it was. At first she thought it must be a walrus or a hippopotamus, but then she remembered how small she was now, and she soon made out that, the only, that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Uh, there's a picture of the mouse. One second. Oh. <sighs> Would it be of any use now, thought Alice, to speak to this mouse? Everything is so out of the way down here that I should think very likely it can talk. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. So she began. Oh, mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I'm very tired of swimming out of swimming about here, oh, mouse. Alice thought this must be the right way of speaking to a mouse. She had never done such a thing before, but she remembered having uh, seen her brother's Latin grammar. A mouse of a mouse to a mouse, a mouse, oh, mouse. The mouse looked at her rather inquisitively, and then seemed to wink at her with one of its eyes, but it said nothing. Perhaps it doesn't understand English, thought Alice. I dare say it's a French mouse, come over with William the Conqueror. For with all her knowledge of history, Alice had very no clear notion of how long ago anything had happened. She So she began again. Oh, crap. It's French. Like a little, uh. Oh, est ma chat. Which was the first sentence in her French lesson book. The mouse gave a sudden leap out of the water and seemed to quiver all over with fright. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice hastily, afraid that she had hurt the poor animal's feelings. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. Not like cats, cried the mouse in a shrill, passionate voice. Would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not, said Alice in a soothing tone. Don't be angry about it, and yet I wish I could show you our cat, Diana. Dinah. I think you'd like a fancy to cats if you could only see her. She is such a dear, quiet thing, Alice went on, half to herself, as she swam lazily about to the pond. <clears throat> And she sits purring so nicely by the fire, licking her paws and washing her face. And she is such a nice soft thing to nurse. And she's such a, ca a capital one for catching mice. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice again. For this time the mouse was bristling all over. And she felt certain it must really be, it must. Oh, okay. She felt certain it must be really offended. We won't talk about her any more if you'd 
rather not. We indeed, cried the mouse, who was trembling down to the end of its tail, as if I would talk on such a subject. Our family always hated mice, cats, nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I won't indeed, said Alice, in a great hurry to change the subject of conversation. Are you, are you fond of, of dogs? The mouse did not answer, so Alice went on eagerly. There is such a nice little dog in our house I should like to show you. A little bright-eyed terrier, you know, with, oh, such long curly brown hair. And it'll fetch things when you throw them, and it'll sit up and beg for its dinner, and all sorts of things. I can't remember half of them, and it belongs to a farmer, you know, and he says it's so useful. It's worth a hundred pounds. He says it kills all the rats, and, oh dear, cried Alice in a sorrowful tone. I'm afraid I've offended it again, for the mouse was swimming away from her as hard as it could go, and making quite a commotion in the pool as it went. So she called softly after it, Mouse dear, do come back again, and we won't talk about cats or dogs either if you don't like them. When the mouse heard this, it turned round and swam slowly back to her. Its face was quite pale with passion, Alice thought. And it said in a low, trembling voice, Let us get to the shore, and then I'll tell you my history. <clears throat> and you'll understand why it is I hate cats and dogs. It was high time to go, for the pool was getting quite crowded with birds and animals that had fallen into it. There was a duck and a dodo, a lorry and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam to shore. <clears throat> I can't believe I just got through two chapters. Whoosh. I'm reading this faster than I thought I would. Let's see, how many chapters are there total? Twelve. Okay, and this... <coughs> so, thanks Alice for dropping by. Hope you're doing good. I need to take a small break in between chapters. Thanks anyone who's actually listening to all this. Ah. <coughs> my dyslexia causes me to add words and change words around a bit. But other than that, I seem to be doing decently. Hey, D man. It's good to see you around. Ah. So, chapter three A Caucus Race and a Long Tail. This is, uh, it's not a first edition. I would never pull out my first edition. But this is a, um, a version from the 1890s. Um, here. This might be like one of the first editions of both books put together, but they were separate before they were together. So, oh, and so far, the Disney movie is pretty much point for point, except for the mouse talking that they left out i mean <clears throat> it's not perfect as it's you know no adaption is but it isn't egregiously different okay so on to the next chapter they were indeed a queer looking party that assembled on the bank the birds were drag the birds was draggled is that even a word draggled <coughs> the birds with draggled feathers the animals with their fur clinging close to them and all dripping wet cross and uncomfortable the first question of course was how to get dry again they had a consultation about this and after a few minutes it seemed quite natural to alice to find herself talking familiarly with them as if she had known them all her life 
Indeed, she had quite a long argument with the lorry, who at last turned sulky and would only say, I am older than you and must know better. And this Alice would not allow, without knowing how old it was, and the lorry positively refused to tell her its age. There was no more to be said. At last the mouse, who seemed to be a person of some authority among them, called out, Sit down, all of you, and listen to me. I'll soon make you dry enough. They all sat down at once. In a large ring with the mouse in the middle, Alice kept her eyes anxiously fixed on it, for she felt sure she would catch a bad cold if she did not get dry very soon. Ahem, said the mouse with an important air. Are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. Silence all around, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favored by the Pope, was soon submitted to by the English, who wanted leaders, and had been of little late accustomed to, um, to usurpation and conquest. Edwin and Morcar, the Earls of Merca, and Northumbra. Ugh, said the lorry with a shiver. I beg your pardon, said the mouse, frowning, but very politely, did you speak? Not I, said the lorry hastily. I thought you did, said the mouse. I proceed. Edward, <coughs> Edwin and Mocure, Mor <coughs> Edwin and Morcar, the earls of Mercia and Northumbra, declared for him, and even Stigmund, Stigand, the patriotic archbishop of Canterbury, found it advisable. Found what, said the duck? Found it, said the mouse replied rather crossly. Of course you know what it means. I know what it means well enough when I find a thing, said the duck. It is generally a frog or a worm. The question is, what did the archbishop find? The mouse did not notice this question, but hurriedly went on. Found it advisable to go with Edgar Atheling to meet William and offer him the crown. William's conduct at the first was moderate. But the insolence of his Normans. How are you getting on, my dear? It continued, turning to Alice as it spoke. As wet as ever, said Alice, in a melancholy tone. It doesn't seem to dry me at all. In that case, said the dodo solemnly. <clears throat> ah. Rising to its feet, I move that the meeting adjourned for the immediate adoption of more energetic remedies. Speak English, said the eaglet. I don't know the meaning of half those long words, and what's more, I don't believe you do either. And the eaglet bent down its head to hide a smile. Some of the other birds tittered audibly. What was I going to say? said the dodo in an offended tone. Was that the best thing to get us dry? Would be a caucus race. What is a caucus race? said Alice. Not that she wanted to know, but the dodo had paused of it, as if it thought that somebody ought to speak, and no one else seemed inclined to say anything. Why? said the dodo. The best way to explain it is to do it. And as you might like to try the thing yourself, some winter day, I'll tell you how the dodo managed it. First, it marked out a race course. It's a sort of circle. The exact shape doesn't matter, it said. And then all the party were placed along the course here and there. But there was no one, two, three in a way. But they began running when they liked, and left off when they liked, so that it was not easy to know when the race was over. However, when they had been running half an hour or so, and were quite dry again, the dodo suddenly called out, The race is over. And they all crowded round it, panting and asking, But who had won? The question the dodo could not answer without a great deal of thought. And, and it sat for a long time with one finger pressed upon its forehead, the position in which you usually see Shakespeare in the pictures of him, while the rest waited in silence. At last the dodo said, Everybody has won. And all must have prizes. But who is to give the prizes? Quite a chorus of, vo chorus of voices asked. Why, she, of course, said the dodo, pointing to Alice with one finger. And the whole party once crowded round her, at once crowded around her, 
calling out in a confused way, Prizes, prizes. Alice had no idea what to do, and in despair she put her hand into her pocket and pulled out a box of comfits. Luckily the salt water had not gotten to it, and handed them round as prizes. There was exactly one apiece, all round. But she must have a prize herself, you know, said the mouse. Of course, the daughter replied very gravely. Who else have you got in your pocket? What else have you got in your pocket? He went on, turning to Alice. Only a thimble, said Alice sadly. Hand it over here, said the dodo. Ah. Then they all crowded round her once more, while the dodo summonly presented the thimble, saying, We beg your, we beg your acceptance of this elegant thimble. And when it had finished this sort of speech, they all cheered. Alice thought the whole thing was absurd, but they looked so grave that she did not dare to laugh, and then she could not think of anything to say. She simply bowed and took the thimble, looking as solemn as she could. The next thing was to eat the comfits. This caused some noise and confusion, as the large birds complained that they could not taste theirs, and the small ones choked and had to be patted on the back. However, it was over at last and they sat down in a ring and begged the mouse to tell them something more. You promised to tell me your history, you know, said Alice, and why it is you hate C and D. She added in a whisper, half afraid that it would offend, be offended again. Mine is a long, sad tale, said the mouse, turning to Alice and sighing. It is a long tale, certainly, said Alice, looking down with wonder at the mouse's tail. But why do you call it sad? And she kept on puzzling about it while the mouse was speaking, so that her idea of the tale was something like this. Furry said to... Just one moment. Okay. <coughs> this is a little bit complicated. When they say it's a sad tale, they mean it literally. Here's a picture of the page I'm about to read. It's literally the mouse's tail as a story. Let's see how this works out. A mouse that he met in the house. Let us both go to law. I will prosecute you. Come, I'll take no denial. We must have a trial. For really this morning I have nothing to do, said the mouse to the cur. Such a trial, dear sir with no jury or judge, would be wasting our breath. I'll be judge, I'll be jury, said cunning old furry. I'll try the whole cause and condemn you to death. This book is fucking weird. This book is really fucking weird. <laughs> you are not attending, said the mouse to Alice severely. What are you thinking of? I beg your pardon, said Alice very humbly. You've got to the fifth bend, I think. I had not, cried the mouse sharply and very angrily. A not, said Alice, always ready to make herself useful, and looking anxiously about her. Oh, let me help undo it. I shall do nothing of the sort, said the mouse, getting up and walking away. You insult me by talking such nonsense. I don't mean it pleaded poor Alice, but you are so easily offended, you know. The mouse only growled in reply, please come back and finish your story. Alice called after it, and the others all joined in chorus. Yes, please do, but the mouse only shook its head impatiently and walked a little quicker. What a pity it wouldn't stay, sighed the lorry. As soon as it was quite out of sight, and the old crab took the opportunity, and an old crab took the opportunity of saying to her daughter, Ah, oh, my dear, does this be a lesson to you to never lose your temper? Hold your tongue, Ma, said the young crab a little snappishly. You're enough to try the patience of an oyster. I wish I had our Dinah here. I know I do, said Alice aloud, addressing nobody in particular. She'd soon fetch it back. And who is Dinah, if I might venture to ask the question, said the lorry. Alice replied eagerly, for she was always ready to talk about her pet. 
Dinah's our cat, and she's such a capital one for catching mice. You can't think. And oh, I wish you could see her after the birds. Why, she'll eat a little bird as soon as look at it. The speech caused a remarkable sensation among the party. Some of the birds hurried off at once. One old magpie began wrapping itself very carefully, remarking, I really must be getting home. The night air doesn't suit my throat. And a canary called out in a trembling voice to his children, Come away, my dears. It's high time you are all in bed. On various pretexts, all moved off, and Alice was soon left alone. I wish I hadn't mentioned Dinah, she said to herself in a melancholy tone. Nobody seems to like her down here, and I'm sure she's the best cat in the world. Oh, my dear Dinah, I wonder if she'll ever... I wonder if I shall ever see you any more. And here poor Alice began to cry again, for she felt very lonely and low-spirited. In a little while, however, she began to hear the little pattering of footsteps in the distance, and she looked up eagerly, half hoping that Mouse had changed its mind and was coming back to finish his story. Okay, that was chapter three. On to chapter four. But I need to get something to drink because my throat is killing me. Plus, why do I even have these on? I'm not listening to anything. <laughs> I'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah, I have no idea why I had those headsets on. It's not like... <laughs> yeah, I did not need it. So, about 50 minutes through, along with breaks, I am four chapters in. Um, this is actually going pretty smoothly. A lot better than I thought it would. Just a moment. Yes. So according to this, there's 140 pages. So we've got about 100 pages left. Not too shabby. So onward to chapter four. The rabbit sends in a little bill, which knowing this particular book means he has a 
freaking duck for some reason. It was the white rabbit, trotting slowly back again and looking anxiously as it went, as if it had lost something. And she heard it muttering to itself, the Duchess, the Duchess, oh my dear paws, oh my fur and whiskers, she'll get me executed, as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Where can I have dropped them, I wonder? Alice guessed in a moment that she was looking for the fan in a pair of white kid that it was looking for the fan in a pair of white kid gloves, and she very good naturedly began hunting about for them, but they naturally began uh, they were nowhere to be seen. Everything seemed to have changed since her swim in the pool. And the great hall with the glass table and the little door had vanished completely. Very soon the rabbit noticed Alice and went hunting about and called out to her in a very angry tone, Why, Mary Ann, what are you doing out here? Run home this moment and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan. Quick now, thank you for the host. And Alice was so much frightened that she ran off once in the direction it pointed to, without trying to explain the mistake it had made. He took me for his housemaid, she said to herself as she ran. How surprised he'll be when he finds out who I am. <clears throat> but I'd better take him his but I'd better take him his fan and gloves, that is, if I can find them. As she said this, she came upon a neat little house on the door, which was a bright glass brass plate with the name W Rabbit engraved upon it. She went in without knocking and hurried upstairs, in great fear she should, lest she should meet the real Mary Ann and be turned out of the house before she had found the fan and gloves. How queer it seems, Alice said to herself, to be going messages for a rabbit. I suppose uh, Dinah will be sending me messages next, and she began fancying the sort of thing that would happen. Miss Alice, come here directly and get ready for your walk. Coming in a minute, nurse. But I've got to watch this mouse hole till Dinah comes back. And see that mouse, see that the mouse doesn't get out. <laughs> Only I don't think, Alice went on, that they'll let Dinah stop in the house if she begins ordering people around like that. By this time, she had found her way into a tidy little room with a table in, a win in the window, and on it, as she had hoped, the fan and two or three pairs of tiny white kid gloves. Does he have to say kid gloves every single time he mentions them? Oh well, such is books. She took up the fan and a pair of the gloves, and was just going to leave the room when her eye fell upon a little bottle that stood near the looking glass. There was no label this time with the words, drink me, but nevertheless, she uncorked it and put it to her lips. I know something interesting is sure to happen, she said to herself, whether I eat or drink anything, so I'll just see what this bottle does. I do hope it'll make me grow large again, for really I'm quite tired of being such a tiny little thing. It did so indeed, and so much sooner than she had expected. Before she had drunk half the bottle, she found her head pressed against the ceiling and had to stoop to save her neck from being broken. See, she hastily put down the bottle, saying to herself, that's quite enough. I hope I shan't grow any more. As it is, I can't get out the door. I can't get out at the door. I wish I hadn't drunk quite so much. Alas. It was too late to wish that. She went on growing and growing and very soon had to kneel down on the floor. In another minute, there was not enough room, even room for this, and she tried the effect of lying down with one elbow against the door and the other arm curled around her head. Still, she went on growing and as, and as a last resource, she put one arm up, out of the window and one foot up the chimney and said to herself, Now I can do no more. Whatever happens, what will become of me? Luckily for Alice, the little magic bottle had now had its full effect, and she grew no larger. 
Still, it was very uncomfortable, and there seemed to be no sort of chance of her ever getting out of this room again, for no wonder she felt unhappy. It was much pleasanter at home, though poor Alice, thought poor Alice, when one wasn't always growing larger and smaller, and being ordered about by mice and rabbits. I almost wish I hadn't gone down that rabbit hole. And yet, and yet, it's rather curious, you know, this sort of life. I do wonder what can have happened to me. When I used to read fairy tales, I fancied that kind of thing never happened. And now here I am in the middle of one. There ought to be a book written about me. And there, that there ought. And when I grow up, I'll write one. But I'm grown up now, she added in a sorrowful tone. Sorrowful tone. At least there's no room to grow up any more here. But then, thought Alice, shall I never get any older than I am now? That'll be a comfort one way, never to be an old woman, but then always to have lessons to learn. Oh, I shouldn't like that. Oh, you foolish Alice, she answered herself. How can you learn lessons in here? Why, there's hardly room for you, and no room at all in any lesson books. And so she went on, talking first one side, taking first one side and then the other, and making quite a conversation of it altogether. But after a few minutes, she heard a voice outside and stopped to listen. Marianne, Marianne, said the voice, fetch me my gloves this moment. Then came a little pattering of feet on the stairs. Alice knew it was the rabbit coming to look for her. And she trembled till she shook the house, quite forgetting that she was now about a thousand times as large as the rabbit and had no reason to be afraid of it. Presently the rabbit came up to the door and tried to open it, but as the door opened inward and Alice's elbow was pressed hard against it, at that, that attempt proved a failure. Alice heard it say to itself, Then I'll go round and get at, in at the window. That you won't, thought Alice, and after waiting till she fancied, she heard the rabbit just... <sighs> Under the window, she suddenly spread out her hand and made, a, and made a snatch in the air. She did not get a hold of anything, but she heard the little shriek and a fall and a crash of broken glass, from which she concluded that it was just possible it had fallen into a cucumber frame or something of that sort. Next came the angry an angry voice, the rabbits. Pat, Pat, where are you? And then a voice she had never heard before. Sure that I'm here, digging for apples, your honor. Digging for apples indeed, said Rabbit angrily. Here, come and help me get out of this. Sounds of more broken glass. Now tell me, Pat, what's in the window? Sure, it's an arm, your honor. He pronounced it. Arm. An arm, your goose. You goose, whoever saw that size? Whoever saw one that size? Why, it fills the whole window. Sure it does, your honor. But it's an arm for all that. Well, it's got no business there at any rate. Go take it away. There was a long silence after this, after this, and Alice could only hear whispers now and then, such as, Sure, I don't like it, Your Honor. At all, at all. Do I tell you, you coward? And at last she spread out her hand again and made another snatch in the air. This time there were two little shrieks and more sounds of broken glass. What a number of cucumber frames there must be thought Alice. I wonder what they'll do next. As for pulling me out of the window, I only wish they could. I'm sure I don't want to stay in here any longer. Yeah. There's a picture of her hand snatching at the rabbit. Let's see if I can get a good... Ah, I'm horrible at this. Oh well. There. Ah. She waited for some time without hearing anything more. At last came a rumbling of cartwheels and the sound of a good many voices talking together. She made out the words, Were the other ladder? Why, I hadn't to bring but one. Bill's got the other. Bill, fetch it here, lad, here.
Ah, uh, put them up at the this corner. No, tie them together first. They don't reach half high enough yet. Oh, they'll do well enough. Don't be particular. Here, Bill, catch hold of this rope. Will the roof bear? Mind that loose slate. Oh, it's coming down. Heads below. A loud crash. Now, who did that? It was Bill, I fancy. Who to go down the chimney? Nay, I shan't. You do it. That's a won't, then. Bill, go, go, go to go down. Here, Bill. The master says you've got to go down the chimney. This is a very convoluted sent uh, sentence structure here. I suppose she's confused, so you're supposed to be. Oh, so Bill's got to come down the chimney, has he? Said Alice to herself. But they seem to put everything upon Bill. I wouldn't be in Bill's place for a good deal. This fireplace is narrow, to be sure, but I think I can kick a little. She drew her foot down as far as the chimney, as far down the chimney as she could, and waited till she heard a little animal, she couldn't guess what sort it was, scratching and scrambling about the chimney close above her. Then saying to herself, this is Bill, she gave one sharp kick and waited to see what would happen next. The first thing she heard was a general chorus of, there goes Bill. Then the rabbit's voice alone, catch him, you by the hedge. Then silence, and then another confusion of voices. Hold up his head, Brandy, said, a Brandy now. Don't choke him. How was it, old fellow? What happened to you? Tell us all about it. Alas, came a little feeble squawking voice. That's Bill, thought Alice. Well, I hardly know. No more to thank ye. I'm better now, but I'll deal, I'm a deal too flustered to tell you. All I know is something comes at me like a jack-in-the-box, and up I go like a skyrocket. So you did, old fellow said the others. We must burn the house down, said the rabbit's voice, and Alice called out as loud as she could. If you do, I'll set Dinah on you. There was a dead silence instantly, and Alice thought to herself, I wonder what they will do next. If they had any sense, they'll take the roof off. But after a minute or two, they began moving about again, and Alice heard the rabbit say, A borrow full will do to begin with. <clears throat> a borrow full of what, thought Alice. But she had not long to doubt, for the next moment a shower of little pebbles came rattling in at the window, and some of them hit her in the face. I'll put a stop to this, she said to herself, and shouted out, You better not do that again, which produced another dead silence. Alice noticed with some surprise that the pebbles were all turning into little cakes as they lay on the floor, and a bright idea came into her head. If I eat one of those cakes, she thought, it's sure to make me change my, make some change in my size, and as it can't possibly make me larger, it must make me smaller, I suppose. So she swallowed one of the cakes and was delighted to find that she began shrinking directly. As soon as she was small enough to get through the door, she ran out the house and found quite a crowd of little animals and birds waiting outside. The poor little lizard, Bill, was in the middle, being held up by two guinea pigs, who were giving it something, were giving it something out of a bottle. They all made a rush at Alice the moment she appeared, but she ran off as hard as she could and soon found herself safe in the thick wood. The first thing I've got to do, said Alice to herself, as she wandered in about the wood, is to grow to my right size again. And the second thing is to find my way back to that lovely garden. I think it will be the best plan. It sounded an excellent plan, no doubt, and was very neatly and simply arranged. The only difficulty was that she had not the smallest idea how to set about it. And while she was peering about anxiously among the trees, a little sharp bark just over her head made her look up in a great hurry. An enormous puppy was looking down at her with large round eyes and feebly stretching out one paw trying to touch her. Poor little thing, said Alice in a coaxing tone as she tried hard to whistle to it, but she was terribly frightened all the time at the thought of it might be hungry, in which case it would be very likely to eat her up in spite of all her coaxing. Hardly knowing what she did, she picked up a little bit a little bit of stick and it held it out to the puppy. 
whereupon the puppy jumped up in the air off all its feet at once with a yelp of delight and rushed at the stick and made believe to worry it. Nell stodged behind a great thistle to keep herself from being run over, and the moment she appeared on the other side, the puppy made another rush at the stick and tumbled head over heels in a hurry to get a hold of it. Then Alice, thinking it was very heavy in a game of play with a cart horse, and expecting every moment to be trampled under its feet, ran round the thistle again, and the puppy began a series of short... Oh my god, this is one fucking sentence. Then the puppy began a series of short... Charges of the stick, running a very little way forward each time, and a long way back, and barking hoarsely all the while, till at last it sat down a good way off, panting, with its tongue hanging out of its mouth, and its great eyes half shut. <sighs> Lewis Carroll makes liberal, liberal use of semicolons, and that was literally one sentence with like ten semicolons in it. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I, technically it's right, but I'm so glad semicolons are not, like, fashionably in anymore. Well, anyways, <laughs> I'm back to the book. Was, um, this seemed to Alice a good opportunity for making her escape, so she set off at once, and ran till she was quite tired and out of breath, and until the puppy's bark sounded quite faint in the distance. And yet what a dear little puppy it was, said Alice as she leaned against the buttercup to rest herself and fanned herself with one of the leaves. I should have liked teaching it tricks very much if if I'd only been the right size to do it. Ugh. Oh dear, I'd nearly forgotten that I'd have to grow up again. Let me see, how is it to be managed? I suppose I ought to eat or drink something or other. But the great question is, what? The great question certainly was what. Alice looked all round her in the flowers and the blades of grass, but she could not see anything that looked like the right thing to eat or drink under the circumstances. There was a large mushroom growing near her, about the same height as herself, and when she had looked under it, on both sides of it, and, she began be and behind it, it occurred to her that she might as well look and see what was on the top of it. Okay, here's a picture of the puppy. I have really I just gotta to learn to do this. And there you go. The puppy attacking Alice from page forty one. And actually that she picked up a little bit of stick and held it out to the puppy. She stretched herself out on the tiptoe and peered over the edge of the mushroom and her eyes immediately met those on the large blue caterpillar. Met those of a large blue caterpillar that was sitting on top with his arms folded, quietly smoking a long hookah, and talking, taking not the slightest notice of her or anything else. Okay, chapter five. Advice from a caterpillar. You know, this book has been weird so far. If the uh, actual movie that Disney made is anything like it, this is going to be even weirder. <laughs> so, take a couple of drinks of water, then start reading about the caterpillar. I just can't believe, like, all of chapter four felt like one freaking sentence. My Hello Kitty cup. Ah, this is rather an insane, insane book. I've actually never read this book. This is a first for me. Ah, the caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. 
Alice replied rather shyly. I, I, I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself. I'm a blah, 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 blah. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, said Alice replied, very politely, for I can't understand it myself to begin with, and because so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet, said Alice, but when you have to turn into a chrysalis... Oops. Hit a wrong button with the book. Oh, there we go. You will someday, and you know. And then after, into a butterfly, I should think you feel a little queer, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. And, uh... Jesus. There's lots of pictures in this book. Ah, there's the caterpillar. Not a bit, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. All I know is it would be very queer to me. You, said the caterpillar contemptuously. Who are you? Which brought them back again to the beginning of the conversation. Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillar's making such very short remarks. When she drew herself up and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why, said the caterpillar. Here was another puzzling question, and as Alice could not think of any good reason, and as the caterpillar seemed to have seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned away. Come back, the caterpillar called after her. I have something very important to say. This sounded promisingly certain. Alice turned and came back again. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. <laughs> is that all said alice swallowing down her anger as well as she could no said the caterpillar alice thought she might as well wait and she had nothing else to do and perhaps after all it might tell her something worth hearing for some minutes it puffed away without speaking but at last it unfolded its arms took the hookah out of its mouth again and said so you think you've changed do you i'm afraid i am sir said Alice. I can't remember things as I used, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Can't remember what things, said the caterpillar. Well, I've tried to say how doth the busy little bee, but it came out different. Alice replied in a very melancholy voice. Repeat, you are old Father William, said the caterpillar. <clears throat> Alice folded her hands and began. <clears throat> You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and I have grown some and have grown most uncomfortably, uncomfortably fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as, I sh as he shook his gray locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of the ointment, one shilling the box, allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than sweat suit. Yet you finished the goose with the bones to the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? Okay, I'm assuming that's suet. Uh, it has to rhyme with do it. Oh my god, this is super long. Okay. In my youth, said the father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife. And the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. 
Your old city youth once was hardly su one would hardly suppose that your eyes were as steadily as steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough. So that his father don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. That is not said right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, said Alice timidly. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from the beginning to the end, said the caterpillar decidedly. There was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the first to speak. What size do you want to be, it asked. Oh, I'm not particular to size, Alice hastily replied. Only one does not like changing so often, you know. I don't know, said the caterpillar. Alice said nothing. She had never been so much contradicted in all her life before, and she felt that she was losing her temper. Are you content now, said the caterpillar? Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind, said Alice. Three inches is such a wretched height to be. It is a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar angrily, wearing itself upright as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone. And she thought to herself, I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended. You'll get used to it in time, said the caterpillar, and it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook it off, and shook itself. Then it got down on the mush off the mushroom and crawled away into the grass, merely remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller, the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what, the other side of what, thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as she had asked it out loud. In another moment, it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoroughly at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which of the two sides of it, and it was perfectly round. She found this a very difficult question. However, at last she stretched her arms round it as far as they would go and broke it off a bit and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now which is which, she said to herself, and nibbled a little of the right hand a bit to try the effect. The next moment she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this and suddenly by this very sudden change, but she felt that there was no time to be lost, as she was shrinking rapidly, so she set to work to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot that there was hardly any room to open her mouth, but she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit. Come, my head's free at last, said Alice in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment, when she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found. All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck which seemed to rise like a stalk out of the sea of green leaves that lay far below her. What can I, what can all that green stuff be, said Alice, and where have my shoulders got to? And oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them around as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and she was delighted to find that her neck would bend about it easily in any direction like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down into a graceful zigzag and was going to dive in among the leaves, when she found to be, which she found to be nothing but the tops of trees under which she had been wandering, when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry. A large pigeon had flown into her face and was beating her violently with its wings. Serpent, screamed the pigeon. I am not a serpent, said Alice, indignantly. Leave me alone. Serpent, I say again, repeated the pigeon, but it's more, but in a more subdued tone. 
and added with a kind of sob, I tried every way and nothing seems to suit them. I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, said Alice. I tried the roots of trees and I've tried bark, I've tried banks and I've tried hedges, the pigeon went on, without attending to her. But those serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled and she thought there was no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. As if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs, said the pigeon, but I must be on the lookout for serpents night and day. Why, I haven't had a wink of sleep in three, these three weeks. I'm very sorry you've been annoyed, said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. And just that I had taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raising his voice in a shriek. And just as I was thinking I should be free of them at last, they must needs come wriggling down. They must needs come wriggling down from the sky. Ugh, serpent. But I'm not a serpent, I tell you, said Alice. I'm a, I'm a, well, what are you, said the pigeon. I can see you're trying to invent something. I'm a little girl, said Alice rather doubtfully. She remembered the number of changes she had gone through that day. You think? Maybe she's in Wonderland. She is on uh, mushrooms right now, literally. <laughs> How you doing, Flaming Ketchup? Mm. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon in a tone of the deepest content. Contempt. I've been a good many, I've seen a good many little girls in my time, but never one with such a neck as that. No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next that you never tasted an egg. Pretty much. I'm just audiobooking the whole book. I am five chapters in. <laughs> we just got past the caterpillar. And she just ate the mushroom that the caterpillar gave her. Yep. I'm an hour and a half in, and I have read, I'm on page 54. <laughs> Of course Alice is on drugs. Haven't you ever seen it? Alice has always been on drugs. <sighs> I have tasted eggs, certainly, said Alice, who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. But if they do, why then they're a kind of serpent, that's all I can say. There was such a new idea to Alice that she was... Well, she's technically not on drugs. She, um, if you've ever read Al or um, seen Alice in Wonderland, she's eating mushrooms and whatnot to grow bigger and smaller. But you know that. Alice was quite silent for a minute or two, which gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding, You're looking for eggs. I know that well enough. And what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a good deal to me, said Alice hastily, but I'm not looking for eggs. As it happens, and if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. We'll be off then, said the pigeon in a sulky tone, as it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting entangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while, she remembered that she still held a piece of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then at the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half of my plan now done. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size. The next thing is to get to that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? And she said this. As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place with a little house in it about four feet high. Whoever lives here, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them this size, why I should frighten them out of their wits. 
So she began nibbling at the right hand bit again, and did not venture to go near the house till she had brought herself down to nine inches high. Interesting. Uh. Chapter 6. Pig and Pepper. Hmm. Let's see. Chapter 6. You know, I'm going to stop here for the night. <clears throat> I will completely destroy my voice if I try doing the entire thing. I think an hour and a half of complete reading is good enough. Let's see, I've got a bookmark. Of course I do. And we will be back on this tomorrow. Same time. Oh yeah, thanks for reading. Or whatever. I will finish that book. I'm actually enjoying it. I just don't want to destroy my voice. An hour and a half is actually quite a lot for reading. I don't know how voice actors do it. Yeah, I'll be back on tomorrow night for the exact same thing. We'll probably finish the book. We're actually about halfway through. <laughs> Twelve chapters. That's chapter six. So yeah. I'll probably will. <sighs> I'm not just going to turn this into a reading stream, I promise. I just wanted to read Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> oh well, you guys all have a nice night. I will see you all tomorrow. <laughs>